just a minute. So we will uh, just a minute, I want to make a formal start. So uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, we're starting uh, the second panel of our uh, workshop, the online seminar. Uh, we have three uh, outstanding uh, people speaking. I'm saying people or women, I should have said. And uh, we're starting with Dr. Rebecca Clifford, who is an associate professor of modern history in Swansea University. Her most recent book, Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust, in Yale, by Yale has been nominated to Britain's Top Books Award, including uh, the Gifford Prize, the Wolf of Hobson History Prize, Wingate Literary Prize, and the uh, Telegraph Book of the Year for 2020. Clifford is uh, at work, currently at work on a new book that examines the link between child Holocaust survivors and the development of the field of child psychoanalysis in Britain under Anna Freud. Uh, so, uh, Rebecca, the floor here is yours. Thank you so much, Boaz. Thank you, Verena. Thank you, Daniela, everybody involved in organizing this amazing event today. I've been very humbled by the, the first set of talks, I have to say, very moved. And as I've just told Boaz, my own children have just come in the door. So it's all a bit, you know, fast and loose 2021. It feels a, so slightly out of control, um, but we'll see if, who bursts in here, hopefully wearing clothes if they do. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. And there we are. Can you, can you see that? Is yeah, that coming through? It's very good. Great, all right. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's so nice to be back with children in crisis again. Gosh, it's an awfully long time since our first meeting years ago now. Um, and I've missed you. Um, and it's lovely to actually look at the audience and see so many colleagues, Holocaust survivors, graduate students, uh, I mean, I, uh, and friends. I, I say hello to all of you. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about the reception of Britain's Lingfield children and I will explain, I'll start by explaining who the Lingfield children were and are. Uh, in August 1945, 300 child survivors of Theresienstadt were brought to Britain on a scheme run by the Central British Fund. And this was part of a plan to bring a thousand what they called concentration camp orphans to Britain. Um, it was a scheme that was never fully realized. Some a little more than 700 children came to Britain on the scheme. After an initial stay in a reception center in Windermere, the youngest of these children, so there were six toddlers under the age of four, and there were nine additional children uh, aged between four and ten, were sent to two specialist children's homes. Uh, both of which operated under the guidance of child psychoanalyst Anna Freud, the daughter of Sigmund Freud, and indeed herself really the field of, uh, sorry, the founder of the field of child psychoanalysis. So the four to 10 year olds were sent uh, to a country estate called Weir Courtney uh, in the village, sorry, the village of Lingfield in Surrey, hence the term the Lingfield children. The toddlers were sent for an initial year of observation um, in a country cottage in East Sussex. And they then joined the slightly older children at Lingfield. Actually, I've got a picture of the, the Lingfield care home here. So this is the, the back, the rear end of this magnificent uh, country estate called Weir Courtney in Lingfield. And it had sort of sloping grounds that went all the way down to the racehorse track because uh, Lingfield is known for horse racing. So together they made up the Lingfield children. And they were cared for um, by the matron of this care home, Alice Goldberger. So this is a very small group of 15 children, much smaller than the older teenage child survivors who came on that same transport, and most of whom were teenagers, and most of whom were boys as well. But they had a series of impacts that far outweighed their size as a group. 
And this is actually the topic of my next book. So as Boaz mentioned, I had a book published this summer called Survivors. Hold on, I've got it in front of me, sort of. It's under the picture of the snake. Uh, here it is. And one of the uh, remarkable stories that I encountered in researching survivors was the story of the Lingfield children. Um, and I thought it was actually such a remarkable story that I sort of squirreled away a lot of that material thinking it deserved its own book. So that's the book that I will start working on in earnest when my own children ever ever go back to school. But it's all a little up in the air. R writing time has kind of dissolved at the moment, but I look forward to uh, getting to work on that book. Um, <clears throat> Now, the reason I think it's worth looking at this tiny group of children is because they garnered a lot of attention, quite considerable media attention, a lot of funding from charities, and most important, I think, attention from a transnational group of child psychoanalysts who were interested in the psychological development of children who had been sorry, deprived of contact with their parents from a young age. So in today's talk, I want to examine that disproportionate attention and mine it for what it tells us about how adults viewed very young child survivors in Britain in those early post-war years and what were the consequences. So I should actually also add that for any of you who are reading survivors or know about it, it tries very hard to focus not on adults and their perceptions of children, but on the children themselves. And really that is what I, I try to do as a historian. And it's what I will ultimately seek to do in this book. But today I am going to talk about the adults uh, involved in this care. I want to argue that this adult gaze hinged on the concept of what constituted a normal childhood. And this was a concept that was really in flux in the post-war period um, and was, uh, you know, a concept being defined by a newly empowered cohort of professional child psychologists and psychoanalysts. And also, so what I want to look at is how adult hopes and fears over this, what they called, this is their words, not mine, war damaged children, um, how they saw children as having been denormalized by war and ultimately also as, uh, you know, possible, of, that doesn't come out right, as renormalizable, <laughs> as able to be renormalized, I think. So all this to say that the focus was less on the rehabilitation of the children's bodies um, but instead was about the rehabilitation of children's minds. Now to put that in a wider context, the post-war uh, rehabilitation of orphaned children, not only Jewish child uh, Holocaust survivors, but um, I mean, there, were, there were many uh, millions of children orphaned, at least in part, um, during the Second World War. So this rehabilitation often focused on, uh, not just on restoring physical health, but also on the normalization of children's psychological and emotional worlds. At the same time, there were fears, and certainly you see them if you look at the, at the international press uh, at the time, of so-called wolf children as carriers of destructive forces. Informed, uh, so this idea informed attitudes towards child Holocaust survivors as well and reflected wider anxieties concerning the instability of European societies in the immediate aftermath of the war. So it's fitting to ask what adults, these adults who managed uh, the reception of young child survivors, such as the Lingfield children, what they saw when they encountered these children. How far did they see in these children stories of ruination and reconstruction that paralleled the larger work of rebuilding damaged buildings and cities and communities and societies in the wake of the war? And how far, and I, I stress this um, with some reservations, but I think you'll see what I, where I'm going. How far did they see the children as a potential experiment? This was a period of unprecedented influence for child psychologists and psychoanalysts. And this was more true in Britain than anywhere else. And the more I work on this and think about this, the more I think it might be a uniquely British story. Keeping in mind, of course, that um, the sort of leaders of the field of child psychoanalysis are all in London at the time, and they've done a lot of work during the war that has made many of them household names. So Anna Freud is one of them, got a picture of her here. Um, Melanie Klein is another. Obviously, they have a very 
ongoing feud between the two of them. And then there's John Bowlby, there's Donald Winnicott and others. And they're all sort of centered. Um, there's a kind of network in Britain that's a very important one. And despite their differences, they all framed children uh, as kind of simultaneously vulnerable and in need of protection, and also as aggressive subjects who required control. This is, um, if there's something you're interested in, it's, it's set out beautifully in Michal Shapira's book, The War Inside. So in this kind of emerging world of a new expertise, um, a normal childhood involved both recognizing children's presumed innate destructive impulses and training and controlling those impulses. Now, the work of these uh, mental health professionals had a wide impact on public opinion and social policy. It promoted an understanding of children as linked to the successful creation of post-war social democracies. So with this in mind, let's briefly look at the reception of the Lingfield children by three different audiences, so first by this cohort of psychoanalysts, second by the charities that funded the children's care, and finally by the media. I think I might have them actually in reverse order, in some sort of order. Let's see what let's see what happens. So, speaking of the uh, the psychoanalysts, from the beginning, Anna Freud played a very specific role in the care of the Lingfield children. She used the network built during her wartime work in creating the Hempstead War Nurseries. So if you don't know about the Hempstead War Nurseries, this was a group of three uh, care homes in the London area that she put together during the war to care for children who had been bombed out of their homes or for other reasons had to leave their home and, and leave their mothers often as well. Um, <clears throat> so she used this kind of network that she built to create these care homes for child Holocaust survivors, both in terms of securing these buildings where they would be housed, and also in terms of um, the staff that ran them. Many of the staff had trained uh, with Freud uh, in psychoanalytic models and practice. And Alice Goldberger, who was the matron of the Lingfield Institution, uh, was training with Anna Freud as a lay psychoanalyst. Why? It's clear that Freud and others in her orbit saw these child Holocaust survivors, um, saw in them, I should say, an opportunity to carry out an experiment. What are the, and one, they wanted to ask, what are the consequences for a child's development of being deprived of the maternal figure from a very young age? Freud instructed staff at the two care homes and this is before the toddlers were moved to the Lingfield house, to keep detailed notes on the children's daily behavior and developmental milestones. And those notes actually, uh, they still exist. They exist in various archives. Um, I have never fully seen them because they are embargoed and they will be embargoed until after I'm dead. Um, but uh, because obviously they contain, it contains sensitive uh, personal information. Um, but you don't actually need to see the notes to understand um, what Freud ultimately did with the material because the notes provided uh, the backbone of a 1951 paper she wrote called An Experiment in Group Upbringing. This paper is a really uh, sort of seminal work in child developmental theory. And in fact, if you go and, and well, as I did, if you go and sit in the section of the library dedicated to child developmental psychology and pull some random textbooks off the shelf, you will see that pretty much every one of them mentions this paper. And in the paper, she sets out the argument based on the notes uh, um, uh, taken on the children's behavior that, the children, the toddlers specifically, the six toddlers who were kind of observed at this separate cottage, um, that they had coped with the loss of their maternal figure because they were taken from their parents at a very young age um, by bonding with each other in unusual ways that ultimately um, helped them sort of, you know, forges the kind of social relationships that help them overcome. I mean, she actually really stresses their resilience their lack of neuroses and the fact that they're kind of on course to, you know, to, to be all right with proper uh, psychoanalytic guidance. Uh, so it's still very, very important um, a piece of work. We need to understand the reception of this obviously very small group of children through this optic. 
the rising power of child psychoanalysis in Britain and the opportunity that the children seem to present to test some of its very basic tenets, especially the idea of the importance of the mother-child relationship. But we might also understand that Freud hoped that the children would take on a parallel role to demonstrate to the world the therapeutic power of care informed by psychoanalytic practice. And here the print media, it was the media next, the print media played a role. There was wide, quite, quite remarkably wide coverage of the Lingfield children and their story in Britain's print media in the years from 1945 to 1950. I got an example. Uh, and actually an, an, a kind of characteristic example, which I chose not because it's special, but just because it's got great pictures. And also because the title is Four Years After the Belson Story, keeping in mind that this is a British audience. Um, it's from the London Illustrated, I think this one. Um, uh, uh, that a British audience, because the British army liberated Bergen Belson, that Belson was a very kind of, it was a word with a lot of symbolic import in Britain at this time. Of course, none of these children had anything to do with Belson. They had not passed through Belson, but it was to sort of, you know, connect with the audience. They use this, this word Belson. Um, so the text of this article stresses the importance of the normalization process for children as future citizens, and also really, the, uh, really stresses the, the value of psychoanalytic care that they are receiving. Some of the text, for example, says things like, the pathological craving for mother love has given way to constructive affection for their own fellows and juniors. This is what Anna Freud argued in her 1951 paper, which obviously hadn't been published yet. A relationship which holds the promise of many a happy normal home in the future when these children from the camps are married and have children of their own. You can also see if I kind of close up of the, of the pictures, uh, two sides to, to, uh, of Erwin. Um, it's sort of like a, a trope, I suppose, that you can still see in literature from children's charities, et cetera, of the before and after picture. So here we see uh, Erwin, um, when he arrived in England, his face told the story of a childhood under the Nazi boot. But you can see that very, uh, I think it's not an accident that physically he looks healthy in the first picture. He's not physically deprived. There's the suggestion that it is a, there's a psychological issue. But now he is a handyman at the London suburban home for the children of the, from the concentration camps and a happy boy, which I think he himself would say, I was never a happy boy, but you can understand why this is being done in this context. Newspaper coverage sought to promote this new psychological approach to children's well-being and reflected the power and reach of psychoanalytic ideas about children and childhood in Britain. And it also reflected a redemptive assumption, both, that, and I say I definitely that is in inverted uh, quotation marks there, both that the war had indeed denormalized children and also that the correct therapeutic care could renormalize them and these are terms you find very frequently in the psychoanal uh, psychological literature the social work literature the literature from charities and aid organizations as well i have to admit having no you know bef i mean when i started working on survivors i i had no background on this topic and i was quite taken aback by some of the words characteristically used to, to describe child survivors um, as being uh, that it, they, are, they are underwritten by a deep assumption of the denormalizing power of war, I suppose. Um, so just, I know that I've got 15 minutes very briefly looking at the, turning to the charities that funded the care of the Lingfield children we find very similar assumptions underpinning literature produced by these charities. I should just add that the Lingfield uh, Care Home was funded entirely by donations. The vast majority of these came through the congregation of the West London Synagogue via covenants. Um, but they also came in kind through donations by the American Foster Parents Plan for War Children, which was an organization that Anna Freud had a long relationship of, of working with. Um, and so particularly we find these tropes in, in uh, fundraising literature. 
Um, for example, here we see one used, um, used, and actually you can see these children are the Lingfield, Lingfield children. And this is being used to collect money for the Central British Fund. And again, there, that's, there's an assumption there. If you invest, you know, if you fund these children, if we can fund their care, then they will be able to walk away from their experiences. We have to uh, start. Uh... We have to stop. I will conclude. No problem. Thank you. I'll tell you about that one. Uh, oh, and that's all there was. So I'm going to stop the screen share. And this is all I really wanted to say in conclusion. Warm environments, public concern and attention, dedicated care, ample funding. We can see in the reception of the Lingfield children in these early post-war years, a situation that would be envied by child refugees today who certainly do not experience any of those things. But there is an underside to the story which I think uh, we might find troubling. And that's the extent to which these children were seen as by some of those who were uh, you know, entrusted with this care as, a, as an experiment. And that's actually the subject of my next book. Um, and I think even, I, I suppose I have found even more troubling the fact that the archives reveal that these children were not, you know, these detailed notes on their behavior didn't stop as they grew up. And in some cases, these children were observed without their consent and without any knowledge on their part until they were in their 40s. Um, with more time, I would tell you about the children's perspectives. And that's something that I obviously will, will be working on in the book. Um, but I think for the time, you know, these, if we look at the children's perspectives, it really complicates the rather neat and tidy redemptive narrative presented here by the adults uh, interested with their care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, people are already writing questions in the chat. Uh, please write your questions there. I must say that uh, we may have a little problem with a uh, we're placing all of them later in the discussion, but we can always transfer these, uh, the, the recording of the chat to our speakers. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Miss Miki Dror, which is uh, working in uh, the Yad Vashem, uh, in the Reference and Information Department in the Yad Vashem Archives. She pursued an MA degree in Holocaust Studies in the University of Haifa. The fields of expertise are concentration camp documents, Lodge Ghetto and the Wertegau, Operation Reynard, and child survivors of the Holocaust, which is why she is here. She will talk about the Yasur group of young Holocaust survivors rebuilding lives in the kibbutz. And I think I saw at least one of them in this in the audience today. Hello, Shmuel. Nice to see you. Hey, Miki, the floor is yours. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Great to be here. I'm very, very excited. It's actually um, the first time I'm presenting uh, the story of uh, this unique group. And I would like, first of all, um, thank Boaz for the opportunity and the backwind over the years to finish uh, the study, which, which is not uh, finished yet. And also to thank from the bottom of, of my heart to the Yasu group members and Gan Shmuel uh, members, the kibbutz members, and especially Shmuel and Freja who are here in the audience. So I can't make any mistakes. And if I do, please don't kill me afterwards. I promise I will correct them all. Um, I will start with the um, screen share, just a minute. Um, okay, can you see it? Um, do you see the screen? But, but uh, make a full screen from the Matsuget. Uh, just a minute. No, it's, no, it's down. Oh, Do you see it now? Okay, can you see it now? Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, okay, um, the story of this group uh, actually begins not in Kibbutz Gan Shmuel, but uh, a lot earlier in uh, Lodge in Poland in 1945. 
in a children home of uh, Shomer Tzair, uh, which was led by Chasia uh, Bornstein Bielitska, and I will uh, later on we'll talk about her. And um, the uniqueness of this group uh, compared to other groups that arrived to Kibbutzim is that uh, the group is still together until this very day. And it's a unique phenomenon because most of the children groups that arrived to Kibbutzim in the uh, aftermath of the Holocaust um, pretty much dissolved. Um, the children or young adults um, usually did not choose to stay in the group or in the kibbutz and uh, started their new life elsewhere. And uh, Yasur is a unique story in, from this perspective because until today, they're a distinct group in the kibbutz Gan Shmuel and uh, people still identify them as Shmuel or Jubek from Yasur as uh, Mordechai from Yasur. It's, it's like a last name of the group and some uh, group members all even chose it as their new last name. Um, this quote is from uh, an interview I conducted a couple of years ago with one of the group members, Anat, a uh, former name Anya Lichten. Uh, she's also still a group member. She lives in Gan Shmuel. Some of her children are also in the kibbutz. And uh, some of the um, later generations of the group, the, even the grandchildren are still in the kibbutz today. So it's, and it, that's another unusual phenomenon, not just in the child survival, in Holocaust survivors, but in kibbutznikim to this day that you have three generations in one same kibbutz. Um, like Just a minute, like mm -hmm. For some reason it didn't, didn't move. Like I had, I will fix it. So, okay. Um, can you see it, the early days? Okay. Um, as I said, uh, the group was formed in Lodge in 1945, um, just after the war. Um, Chasia Bornstein Bielitska, the young, lovely woman you see on the left, um, she was a 24 year old Holocaust survivor from Godno. Um, she was uh, a partisan. Um, that uh, was even honored by the uh, Soviet Union as a war hero. And uh, she established the children home in Lodge in uh, Norutovice 18 in Lodge in 1945-46. And uh, she started to gather children that survived the war both in Poland itself in assumed identity or in hiding or with the partisans and also children that were repatriated from the Soviet Union after fleeing from Poland with their families in 1939. Um, the group that she uh, started to receive in the home consisted of children from even toddlers two years old until children that were um, 15 or 16. And some of the kids uh, were adopted or we just moved on uh, to different places. But this specific group um, that came there, some of them had at first a different uh, leader that was called uh, Sala. But uh, later on, when the um, children fled from uh, Poland in the Bricha, uh, when they fled to the DPGMs in Germany, later on, Chasia was the only leader of the group. And at the peak of the amount of children, she was leading 500 children in DP camps uh, in Germany and later on from France to um, on the way to Palestine, they were caught and deported to Cyprus. Um, although this presentation will focus more on the days in the Gan Shmuel after arrivals to the kibbutz, it's uh, very important to stress out that the group was uh, actually established in lodging in the DP camps. So when they arrived to Gan Shmuel, they were already a distinct group. They are very, um, they're already very united and very close to each other. And that's uh, a key factor for the, uh, for the rest of the group history. Uh, what you can see here are uh, ceremonies that uh, the group had in the DP camps. Uh, I'm not sure if this uh, picture is from Zelsheim or from Dornstadt, but um, as you can see, you can see here Chasia in the middle leading uh, the ceremony. She was um, 
a very committed uh, Hashomer Atzair member. And this is also, this is also important because um, everything that has to do with the ideology of uh, Hashomer Atzair and the group unity is also another uh, contributing factor, in my opinion, to the unity of the group uh, until today. Um, the group left Lodge after the Kelze program in uh, 1946 and moved to Germany. Uh, in Germany, they moved from uh, for at least uh, two two times in the uh, two DP camps in Selsheim and uh, Dornstadt, and from there they moved to um, to France and to Cyprus. Uh, Chasia was um, not just uh, a leader of the group; she was a mother figure, and she was uh, a caretaker and a role model for the children. Uh, the Asur group that were ages, their ages were between uh, 12 and uh, 15. They admired her and they kept close contact with her until her passing away in 2012. And uh, until today, they talk of her um, very dearly and they miss her a lot. And even uh, their children and grandchildren uh, consider her as kind of uh, the, the big mother of uh, the group. And she took the children that were just, you know, they, were, they had shattered light after the war. They lost their parents, they lost their families. Some of the children, especially their repatriated children, still had uh, surviving siblings or a surviving parent, but most of the children were orphans. And uh, Chasia encouraged them to uh, write their memoirs, to talk about their feelings, she, uh, she, they say that she brought them back to life with games and with compassion and with love. And she took care of them because a lot of the children, especially the ones that uh, spent the uh, wartime in Poland had also uh, identity crisis of uh, going back to Judaism after being uh, in hiding as, as Poles. Um, when the uh, group arrived to Cyprus, uh, Hasia was told that she cannot uh, take the children under her care after arriving to Palestine and the, the roads have to, um, to depart. Uh, she had to agree heavy heartedly to the decision of uh, Shomer Atzeir, but uh, she insisted of, uh, on choosing the uh, kibbutz where the children will go to. And she chose Gan Shmuel because of uh, the educator that was supposed to uh, accept the children. His name was uh, Ben Greenboim. He was a renowned educator in uh, Shomer Atzair. He was the son of uh, Itzchak Greenboim, which was representative in the Polish same in the 30s. And he was a very uh, known figure in uh, Shomer Atzair. Um, here you see the um, children of the group. Um, at, upon their arrival to Gan Shmuel, as you can see, uh, it's important to see that uh, some of them look very Polish. It's the, especially the children that were in uh, assumed identity. And at first the kibbutz members considered them as uh, uh, Poles and non-Jews, and as uh, people that uh, tried to smuggle themselves to Palestine to live among the Jews and are not even Jewish. Some of these kids uh, tell that, um, the kibbutz members um, gave them kind of a Judaism test to see if they remember the holidays, if they remember songs, and if they failed, they were called Polacks, which is a degrading uh, form of uh, being a, a Catholic Pole. Um, at first, when the children came to Gan Shmuel, um, the kibbutz didn't have um, housing for them. So they were settled in a packaging factory in the outskirts of the kibbutz. A uh, rather isolated place from the rest of the kibbutz, and uh, they were there for the first uh, six months of their stay in the kibbutz. And their stay was supposed to be a part of a three years program of Aliyat Noah, which combined both school studies and work to fund their stay in the kibbutz. Uh, it's important to stress out that, uh, in general, Hashomer Atzair and uh, specific, specifically Gan Shmuel. Uh, saw the um, idea of work and of uh, child labor or youth uh, working in the kibbutz as a very important step in the uh, reformed person, the reformed new Jew of uh, Israel. 
So to see uh, these young children work hard was not a phenomenon that people, you know, felt uh, bad about or uh, that is something to be, you know, considered as not done to these uh, children. But um, another thing that uh, one has to remember is that um, the children of Yasur group, uh, still called Geulim then, uh, had to work more hours than the native kibbutz children uh, because um, they believed that uh, the other children of the kibbutz, their parents worked for their stay in the kibbutz and that um, Geulim or Yasur has, has to support themselves, therefore they have to work more hours. So their uh, usual uh, school week consisted of half a day of schooling and half a day of uh, we have pretty much uh, agricultural work. And uh, sometimes it was uh, in the day they had to work and in the afternoon to study, and sometimes it was uh, the other way around. Uh, upon arrival to the kibbutz, um, six younger girls of uh, Yasul cohort were supposed to move to uh, another group, the parallel age group uh, in the kibbutz, which was called uh, Shibulim. And because um, Yasul group was considered to be uh, too, bit too large um, to be on their own and the lack of children in the kibbutz had to, to prove this move as well. Uh, one girl, this uh, blonde pretty one, Anat, uh, refused uh, to move to the group of the kibbutz and she insisted on staying with uh, Geulim. And uh, later on, this uh, young uh, opinionated person became the secretary of the kibbutz. And it was the first time that uh, the kibbutz did uh, what she had to, to say. Um, in the first six months, as I said, they, the group didn't live in the kibbutz itself, but uh, they still had contact with the uh, kibbutz members, you know, during uh, work days. And, but the schooling was separated from the other children. And uh, the group members uh, described their first half a, half a year as a rather isolated period from other children. Uh, also, there was a, a language barrier because although the children did have um, Hebrew studies uh, already in Lodge, uh, their language was very basic when they came uh, to, to the kibbutz. So they could converse with the rest of the kibbutz members in Polish and that also um, the kibbutz members had uh, a lot of bad things to say about it because, again, they insisted on the children being assimilated more in the kibbutz. Um, there is a report um, of their uh, madrich, of their leader in the kibbutz, uh, Benjamin Greenboy, dated uh, 1948 after a year of arrival uh, in the kibbutz. Uh, the report is uh, some 20 pages um, that uh, describes the academic advance of the children, uh, their advance at work in the kibbutz. And um, the interesting thing about it is that there is not a single word on the emotional or psychological state of the children. It's just uh, a report that says that uh, in mass, in uh, math or in science, their grades are so and so. They worked in the uh, fields for such and such hours, but there is not a word about uh, what these children, who, who they are, and uh, what was what what was happening with them prior to the arrival to the kibbutz. Uh, only in the last two pages, uh, ben Benjamin Greenbaum remarks that. Um, the children had suffered a lot in the in Poland before their coming to Israel, and uh, we tried to first to show them uh, affection and compassion, but uh, then we decided that it was uh, a bad decision because it created a lack of obedience of uh, the children. Uh, so we decided that uh, any signs of uh, warmness and affection should be stopped, and uh, the children uh, also admit that. Uh, it was, this was the kind of feeling that they got from the kibbutz members of uh, kind of, uh, I don't even know how to call it. It's just a uh, rear, um, you know, just hello and goodbye and uh, not far from, uh, not a lot of more than that. And another important notion is that uh, in kibbutz Gan Shmuel in those days, um, Children, of course, had a communal upbringing, not just the Holocaust survivors, but also the native kibbutz children. 
And in the afternoons, the children would visit their, their parents and their families. Uh, usually children uh, that are called uh, outsiders in the kibbutz can go, they usually get adoptive families and can go visit uh, families. But the Yasu members did not get adoptive families and they stayed together with themselves in the afternoons. And that also contributed to the group uh, bondness and the togetherness and created a, a feeling of us and them. They say that I'm already uh, past my time, so I will go directly to the, uh, to the summary. Um, well, I, I have so much to say about this group and uh, so little time, but uh, I consider the case of Yasur as a successful reception because uh, in retrospect, when I interviewed uh, the group members, most of them said that they achieved their goals in life. They raised families. Uh, they worked in uh, areas of expertise that they liked. They uh, chose to stay in the kibbutz as adults. Uh, some of their children also chose to stay in the kibbutz, which is, as I said, rare even in, uh, in non-Holocaust survivors uh, group members. Um, in my opinion, the, the uh, factors contributing to the success of uh, Yasu is, first of all, uh, the age group of uh, 12 to 15, which is uh, an age group that uh, bonding between uh, your peers is a lot stronger than you know, going out to, to your parents. Uh, the similar background of uh, the group members that created the solidarity and the closeness to each other. Uh, the key figure of Chasya that combined both caretaking and emotional support and the mother figure and the role model until adulthood. And also the uh, communal upbringing uh, of the kibbutz, which was, uh, although considered uh, strict and uh, somewhat Spartan, uh, avoided the emotional conflict of replacing the, uh, your own family and uh, the emotional burden of calling somebody else's, somebody else's mother when you think about your uh, murdered one. Um, and also, um, these kids were Holocaust survivors, and uh, they saw, you know, the truth that it is. And in those days, to be a child in Kibbutz Gan Shmuel meant that you had better condition compared to uh, the outside environment in early days Israel, uh, as their parents that uh, came in the 50s, that made Aliyah in the 50s, they uh, had to struggle for their lives here in Israel. So I'm so, so sorry for uh, being a bit, uh, um, well, as you can see, English is not my uh, mother tongue. Um, and I thank you. And uh, I have a lot more to say about this group and about their, their success. And I hope that their will, good experience will uh, contribute to children still suffering today. And thank you. Thank you, Miki. This was really uh, amazing. And I knew you had a lot to tell us. And now you have to finish that thesis. And uh, stop sharing your screen, please, okay? Okay, just a minute. There I go. And now we have, uh, we are going from the past, we already met the present in Miki's talk, and we are now going to work in the present. We have Miss Nehama Greinemann. Uh, she is a doctor researcher in art psychotherapy in Brunel University in London. She has an MA in art therapy from the University of Haifa, Israel, and a BFA from the Academy of Fine Arts in Flor Florence, Italy. Her research focuses on a, include art therapy with refugees as well as fathers, fathers, clay, paternal representations, and mentalizations. She has worked over the years with diverse populations in different settings in countries such as Ethiopia, Armenia, and Israel. For the past five years, she's been working in Berlin, Germany, with at-risk children from migrant and refugee backgrounds and their parents. Nehama is currently focused on the integration of art therapy in schools and refugee shelters, working as a part of the an international psychological team through Israel Aid Germany. Uh, so, and Nehama, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I can share as well, right? I, I'll yes. just do share screen. Hopefully. Yeah, I hope it works. <laughs> Done this before. It's working. Okay. Thank you. Um, I must say these are very hard uh, 
acts to follow <laughs> it was fascinating and uh, very enriching for me. Um, and uh, yeah, for, thank you for inviting me, first of all, to Verena and Gunta as well, who made the connection. Um, and also on a very personal note, as a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors and uh, you know, I'm just throwing in my little personal thing because uh, sometimes it's talked about, sometimes it isn't, but it's very, very personal for me. My grandmother was in a DP camp and Shomel Ta'il, so um, yeah. <laughs> so very interesting to hear other perspectives about it. Uh, but yeah, now let's talk a bit about the present, about Germany. So uh, as mentioned, um, Gunther was talking about uh, TFST. And uh, oh, I just also wanted to say that I, um, one more personal note, um, because working with refugees and with trauma, my grandparents who unfortunately passed away already are always in my mind, then um, I'm, I'm very honored to have Holocaust survivors here because I always wonder what they would think about my work. So <laughs> comments are welcome. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I work for Israel Germany. I'm, I'm in Berlin at the moment um, and um, we are close partners with Tet Veste here in Germany. Um, the, the different, uh, I tried to, we have a lot of partners in a lot of locations. So I tried to sum it up as quickly as I can here. Uh, as you can see Tet Veste, and we also work um, with different um, governmental bodies. Uh, we work in six different locations in Germany and Greece. Um, at, sorry, six different projects, 30 locations. 10 cities, as you can see, we're, we're spread out um, quite all over um, Germany and um, also in Greece. And we reach a lot of refugees. We reach uh, 6,000 per year. Um, I'm specifically from the PSS department, the psychosocial department. So we have two departments. Um, one is psychosocial and wasn't, one is focused on leadership. Um, I am not going to represent the leadership so much, even though it's very essential and important for us in the psychosocial work, because we do um, believe in working interdisciplinary and uh, we have refugees who are also working with us as a team. So uh, these links between the two sides are very important. Um, I also want to say I was Verena um, very nicely asked me to bring a case study of one of the children I work with. Um, and this was a very sensitive thing because this is online and uh, um, I've never shown a case study online. So I want to emphasize that I brought a few images that were um, I very closely spoke to um, the child and the mother involved and it's all under consent. And it's all very, very carefully picked. So it's nothing too personal. Nonetheless, for anyone watching or even watching afterwards, if it's recorded and shown, please do me the favor of this image is fine, but the images after, um, uh, yeah, don't don't take screenshots. Just uh, ask me if uh, so I can ask the child directly. Um, yeah. So um, I want to focus on art therapy, and I want to say also I'm. I'm working as an art therapist here in Berlin. I've worked in shelters and in a school, um, but I'm also coordinating the psychosocial team. So we have a team also of psychologists, Arabic speaking psychologists, um, and yeah, art therapists uh, scattered around. Um, and our primary focus is stabilization, stress reduction. Um, we are um, very careful if some of the children have, well, only been here in Germany for a few years are still sort of in the midst of um, a lot of very difficult, stressful, traumatizing experiences. Um, um, so sometimes you really stay in the stabilization um, mode, <laughs> so to speak. And um, we work with children and children and parents and also with adults, specifically with Yazidi um, also survivors. Uh, I, I, I'm not specifically working with Yazidis, but it's a project that we're also involved in. So that answers maybe a question I think that was brought up here about other organizations working with Yazidis. Uh, and as I say, we, I 
very deeply believe and the whole staff believes in uh, working interdisciplinary. So I work closely with a social worker, with a psychologist, uh, with um, people doing leadership, community activity. And I assume that all of you um, Holocaust historians out there are well aware of Friedel Dika Brandeis, but um, I thought she is very, very important to bring here because at least for me, she, she, she very much informs my work in the sense that she is to some, the mother of art therapy, <laughs> of someone who really believed in the, the power of art to help. So I brought a little quote um, from 1940 uh, that aesthetics is uh, as another thinner skin protecting against chaos uh, as a last instance means of escape, last motor of capable, uh, motor capable of cre creating production while defending man from forces over which he can has no control. The image you see here is from a shelter I worked in where we did some community work. We, we painted their, their environment. It was a nice sunny day. It's snow in Berlin right now, so it's hard to believe, but it, it was sunny and um, uh, they, they got to contribute to the way the shelter they live in actually looks and to work together as a group. Um, and I brought another art therapist, uh, Dr. Kalmanovitz, who was also involved in some of the planning uh, of our concepts, um, who, yeah, um, essentially explains a little bit about what art therapy is for trauma and uh, especially for refugees. Um, the, the plus about it is that it's um, nonverbal or not entirely verbal. And so there's the um, ability also to access nonverbal uh, material and to bridge language, but not on, also only language, also trauma related uh, boundaries to communication, to sharing, emotional sharing, identity. Um, and uh, really the essence is, um, creating a space that is non-judgmental, that is safe, that is accepting. Um, this image you see over here is um, actually from, I'm not gonna get into it because 15 minutes is a short amount of time, but uh, from a video we made during uh, one of the lockdowns. So we've been active throughout and as much as possible working under all the conditions we've, ha we've had to del deal with in the past year. Um, and this is just a little uh, example for you here of uh, um, a room in a shelter, how it might be, every location, every shelter is different, but how it might be set up when we work with children. Um, a little background about specifically how the art therapists in Israel uh, are working and how I work. So we work uh, essentially mostly in small groups um, or sometimes we do bigger workshops and sometimes individually. Um, it really depends on the place we're working in. There's a big variety in the way shelters are. Uh, I'm sure when you're talking about DP camps and everything that was um, um, mentioned before, there, were, there was a great vari variability. So it really differs from city to city. Um, and yeah, what I'm gonna bring is one specific case. Um, maybe before I mention the case, uh, I um, want to give you a bit more of a picture of um, the people we work with. Um, so as I mentioned, one population is Yazidis, but um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, there was a big wave of refugees that came to Europe and specifically to Germany, um, peaking in 2016. And a lot of them were Syrian related to the um, civil war in Syria, um, but also from Afghanistan, Iraq, African countries, um, a variety of places. And, um, and there is, the, there, compared to the amount of people coming there uh, uh, is really still a struggle to find sort of a systemic way of dealing with their emotional and psychosocial needs. Um, there are, um, I think right now, 30, 
38 or 39 specific psychosocial centers for uh, refugees, which is very little if you think of Germany. There's really, there's waiting lists and they only take uh, a few hundred people. So there's a great, great need. And this child that I'm bringing here, we'll call him A for the sake of um, anonymity, uh, even though again, he's well aware that we're presenting today. Um, he came from Iraq and um, I, again, I'm going to try to not give too much of his background information because this is on the internet, but um, he did experience a lot of um, direct uh, war related um, violence and trauma um, hit from a bombing on his home to losing his father uh, to seeing violence and also the, 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 the whole way, the whole traveling all the way to Europe almost drowning. I'm sure these are stories that most of you have heard of and seen in the news. So it's, it's, a, it's actually a very um, extreme one. Not everybody has the kind of background that he has, but uh, he's already experienced a lot at a very young age. He came when he was four and by then had experienced all of these things um, and came alone with his mother um, who was also injured and uh, they, they moved shelters a few times, he moved schools twice, uh, until they finally got an apartment in Berlin. And this, the point where I met him was in a school in Berlin, where um, I had the possibility to uh, do therapy with him, first in a group constellation and then um, individually. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into a long process here because it's really... Uh, um, a small vignette, but um, the main emphasis I put uh, in, into the art therapy process is establishing trust and establishing a relationship. And as some of you might imagine, this is something that takes a long time and um, uh, a lot of um, negotiation. And it happens through art materials for, in my profession. So, um, Drawing wasn't very cool. There was drawing that I didn't bring here, but uh, creating objects from um, uh, all kinds of uh, ninja games that he likes and uh, video games was very interesting and really um, played on this place of, um, am I safe? Am I not? Am I protected? What's dangerous? And uh, we created a whole dialogue there of, me telling him what the boundaries are, what he can do, what he can't do. So cutting and poking holes and using hot glue. And at some point um, he um, built a sort of a, a little spaceship, he called it, a car that turned into a spaceship that would transport, that would take him away. And again, influenced by these uh, video games and the things that he likes to play with. Um, he, he did this kind of, he attempted to do Chinese calligraphy. Um, and I, in the questions and answers, if we have time, I would be happy to go into the whole, um, everything to do with the, the cultural identity search that um, is linked to it because it's complicated. Uh, he's from a Muslim background. Um, but here, what I did was I just jumped in and said, oh, I happen to, um, uh, I happen to know an, a real ninja. <laughs> there was a whole discussion about what ninjas do and are they violent? Uh, and do they control their, um, their, their, their uh, behavior? Um, this is actually my husband. My husband happens to be a martial artist. So I used something from home and I just brought him a, uh, an image of a real ninja practicing for over 20 years. <laughs> so um, to convince him that it's about protection, less about acting out. Uh, and I also use something that I uh, learned myself, which is a little bit of Chinese calligraphy. I said, okay, you like to make graffiti and because he, he also likes graffiti. He mentioned this when I said I was gonna present about him that he would love to show his graffiti. Um, and he was interested in Chinese calligraphy. So I said, okay. Now this I have to explain as background also, which I didn't mention at the beginning. 
uh, is a child who was diagnosed with PTSD and ADHD. And it's a child that couldn't sit for more than five minutes, which is why he couldn't really be in a group constellation. He couldn't focus for more than a few moments. Um, but what was really, really beautiful was the ability to link to this something he was interested in and show him that if he wants to manage to write something, a word, to learn a word, um, he has to practice. And so it took sitting and breathing and um, practicing until he got to the place where he was um, really, really proud of the new words he learned. Um, although this is a child that's also not struggling, his German is okay, but you know, he's already got a few languages, but knowing that he can uh, write a few um, words in Chinese was uh, something very empowering for him. Um, yeah, the one of them in the middle there, I don't know how to, if you see my mouse, is uh, qi as in energy. So uh, we also discussed the meaning of these words. Uh, and um, just as a little vignette, I sort of ran through a whole year of uh, working with the child, but um, uh, the one thing that was really important was his ability after he really sat and practiced and chose the words himself and decided what he wanted to create and share. He had the ability to, we had an exhibition for the children in the school and they got the chance to choose what they wanna share, what they wanna call it, where, what's the background color, where they're gonna hang it and who's gonna see it. Um, and he was very, very proud and sort of reintegrated into um, sharing in a group constellation again. Um, yeah, so that's the little um, short vignette about this one boy from Iraq who was very proud, I must say, to be, um, to, to, to show something about his work. Um, yeah, this is my contact information. You can ask any questions if we have a few minutes. Uh, I think, I don't, I don't know if my time is up or um, because we were running a little late. Oh, I can't hear you, you're still on mute. You can get another minute if you want. Well, you know what, actually, I feel like, you know, it's like there's so much information and so much to bring. And I feel like I'm my there's my colleagues. I mean, we we do so many projects, it's hard to represent everyone. So I really wanted to bring one small example. And maybe I'll give another extra minute for questions and I can gladly answer them. We'll, we'll, uh, or yeah, this is just the, the so we'll do a question uh, round for all. Okay. Uh, I, actually, we what we have now. I, I, I looked over the questions, and I feel we are talking in the end about a uh, one big issue, and this is the the place of the group, or in mm -hmm. your case, in Hama, the child without a group. Yes. Yes. Well, we saw. Uh, I. I think we saw two types of groups. I'm not sure. I think Linkfield is very different than uh, the Yasur group, no less because uh, uh, Hasia really didn't hold with psychiatrists. She said that uh, we didn't know what to do with the children, but no one knew better than us. Hmm. Like there was no one who could tell us what to do. So we had to work it out. So I think uh, we are asking about the importance of the group for the rehabilitation of the children, or uh, in the case of Nehama, we'll ask it the other way around, or maybe you can tell us if you do group projects in therapy, or how this child in the end can be brought back to group, or is the group important for such a child, and so on. So I will give, we'll make a round Okay. this okay. question. So we'll start with, uh, according to the, with Rebecca, Miki, and Nehama. Okay, oh. so Rebecca. Thanks very much, Boaz. Um, you know, okay, I, stop sharing I your stop screen. Sharing, yeah, I, uh, wait, I have to, ah, that's no, one thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I told you that um, based on the notes that um, Anna Freud had collected about the specifically about the six toddlers. So they were the six children under four years old uh, who were very carefully observed for a year. And she wrote this paper making this argument that it was actually the group that had sort of acted as, as a replacement for the normal, normal 
bond of love between a, a mother and a child. So there's a certain irony in the fact then that, um, as I've said, that the youngest group of children ended up coming after a year to Lingfield House, but the toddlers were, I'm going to say were considered. If you, if you try to pin, if you ask me to pinpoint who made this decision, decision, I don't know, but they were considered young enough for adoption. And so most of those children were adopted. I'm just trying to think if there was one exception, one boy who was not adopted, but they were adopted. Um, the older children who were old enough to speak up and protest were on the whole not adopted because most of them preferred to stay in the group environment, which for all the sense that I've talked about this aspect of it being an experiment, it was a very loving home. And the, the matron was, uh, I mean, evidently a wonderful person and the children really loved her and they loved each other, that, that was their family. But the youngest children didn't have a choice. And actually they are the ones whose stories are in many ways the most, um, difficult and broken and fragmentary because they lost that group that had given them some some support and some strength and they were sort of chucked out into the world of adoption and there they found that for the most part their adoptive families did not want them to remember their time in the group home or frankly anything from their early lives so I tell the story of a few of those children in survivors there's one in particular Jackie um, I tell his story throughout because because I find it a very moving story because he remembers in dreams his time in Lingfield and he keeps asking his parents I've got this you know I got this dream about this gorgeous big house and long like uh, you know sweeping green grass going down to a to a race track where is that and his parents keep saying oh everybody's got dreams like that it doesn't mean anything and it's only when he's actually on the verge of getting married, he's driving around in the countryside with his fiance and he sees Lingfield House and, and realizes, oh my God, it's not just a dream, it was true. So I guess, uh, what am I saying? I'm saying that actually there, there was a great power for many of these children in the group. And those who struggled the most were the ones who were forced to leave it and they were forced to leave it because they were too young to kick up a fuss about it I think in many ways and you know it has echoes with what Beth was talking about earlier about the very difficult path of adoption you know both for child survivors and, and also for the families who who adopted them uh, I'll I'll pass the pass the floor okay. maybe some more words about your group um in the case of uh Yasuo, um most of these children uh, pretty much lost faith in the um, conventional family in the wartime years because they didn't feel protected by their parents. Um, some of the children in Poland were saved in uh, communal upbringing um, institutions like convents or orphanages and uh, especially the children that fled to the Soviet Union uh, were put, uh, most of them were put in a Soviet uh, children home. So the communal upbringing was not uh, a foreign idea for them. And uh, especially in uh, early days, uh, Israel, uh, the socialist movement was very, very strong. And the common belief was that uh, the best place for a child was a communal upbringing and not the uh, conventional traditional family. Um, in addition to that, uh, some of the Yasuo members were supposed to be uh, taken for adoption or uh, for uh, foster families or for uh, far relatives, and they didn't want to leave the group, but they were uh, in a way old enough to choose. They were 15, so even if they were taken from the kibbutz, they ran back. So uh, as we say in Israel, they uh, voted by foot, so even if they were told uh, to do something else, they were uh, rebellious enough to, to stand for their own. Thank you, Miki. And Hama, please. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll try to uh, or, or organize my thoughts um, because it's quite complicated. I think we need to remember all the different aspects here. So uh, one very simple thing is that to bring a, a case study, it was really important for me to directly speak to the child and the mother. It's harder to do that in a group. So I wanted to make sure that this, so that's one very simple reason why I brought one child. 
Um, another is I do have one colleague who's about to, I think, to work with unaccompanied minors, but I did not. I work with families and that's a very big difference. And I think it's a big difference to remember. Yes, there are unaccompanied minors and there is research about them, but there are a lot of families. And so we're talking about children who come with their parents and who come with their families. And that makes a very, very big difference. Um, and that's also why I do parent-child uh, uh, workshops because I find the work with the parents just as essential as a, working alone with the children. Yes, there is a very strong element of groups in the shelters I've worked in, in the school. It is very complex. Also, I am well aware of the fact that among Jewish uh, survivors, there's also culturally and religiously complexity, like, like it's a complex group. But here we have people from different religions completely different languages, different countries, just stuck together in a shelter. And um, that, again, creates a lot of sort of multifaceted dynamics between families. Um, so I'll have groups where I have um, all these things come up, which makes it very hard to create a sort of a, a group that sticks together and doesn't offend each other or things like that. Um, that said, I think group or non-group, what I do see that is true is that consistency and stability uh, is a very important aspect. And one of the pluses and the things that we can give at Eastlade is we've had the, the privilege, speaking about funding with the um, um, uh, father, I, I forget. Um, De Bois. De Bois was saying, yeah, that uh, we really have the privilege that we can work long term. I've worked with children for two years or for one year where they've constantly been in the open studio in the art therapy setting. This makes a huge difference. I've been in small projects where you're one, two months with the child and that's something so essential and so complicated to, to bring across and to explain because it requires more funding, but that's what the children need. They need consistency, they need stability, they need over time to, to create you know, this group cohesion, this community in among themselves. Uh, thank you to our uh, amazing speakers in the two, uh, in the two panels. I, I, when we dreamed this up, uh, we knew we are bringing the best people around and it proved itself. So thank you all of you, what uh, I, in the program now, and we are in on time, I'm supposed to give them concluding remarks and I want to put all this event we are today, I want to put it in context and I'll do my own bit of sharing now. Uh, what you are seeing here is our uh, site of uh, Verena's and my project of children of war, Holocaust and genocide the relevance of post World War II in Holocaust for today's world. Actually, this was born in the middle of the Middle Eastern crisis with the millions of refugees on the move and children being hurt. And we felt that we, have to, we had to do something. We were historians, okay? We were also in touch with the Israel, in Israel and stuff, but generally uh, we're historians of children. So probably there's something we can do. And the belief of this project is that it's our claim that historians can contribute with their expertise in rehabilitating war affected children today. And uh, as you can see, it's a response of children to war and genocide. It's all today as well. Homes and shelters, challenges of rehabilitation, family reunification, education issues, giving children a voice, fostering adoptions with unaccompanied children, sexual violence against minors, resettlement. These are all issues which we felt, and this is like an encyclopedia. If you open it, you can see a quote from a child or a quote from us about the best interest of a child, best practices. This was a discussion that the world already had. Now we know that the world I mean, people working with refugees are discussing this for the last, uh, if we start from, from before World War II, from post-World War I to, to today. We have not invented the wheel. But we believe that there is a whole body of knowledge and experience that was gained in the post-World uh, War II and Holocaust world. 
that can be beneficial to people today. So uh, one of the basic things we did, we, we, uh, we put uh, uh, the, is events. And actually this is our, a lot of people ask me, what is children in crisis V? The answer is it's the fifth time we are doing this. Our last one was in Potsdam, University of Potsdam right before the Corona, really right before last week, a year ago. And I saw uh, my Facebook reminded me. So we started off, we had uh, funding and a lot of help from Uni University College London. And we had a three day workshop in London. We flew, on, flew in people from uh, Greece, from uh, NGOs. We couldn't get to people in Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Turkey, it didn't work, but we did get NGOs who are working there. And since then we've been doing a yearly workshop where we bring together just like this workshop, people uh, doing work, people who either work with children, bringing together historians and practitioners for the sake of today's children. Now, this is something we really believe in. We really believe that this is a, can be helpful. Uh, we've built, uh, as you can see here, we have a video library of uh, uh, videos we gave and other people gave actually the, the first, uh, think we did internationally was me speaking in the ICC uh, as a guest speaker speaking about work with children after the war and how we can learn for today. Uh, the Israeli, the, that was five years ago and the question every Israeli asked me was didn't they lock you up when you went there as Israeli? Uh, so I don't know if today I would have gone but yesterday I would have gone, I went and it was a very good event. And we started off from then. Once we were with the ICC, so people were willing to listen to us. We I'm telling all the researcher colleagues here that we built a, a library. We have we've posted here our papers and conference presentations on all issues of child rehabilitation. So we have a library. We have a, a project I, uh, that started many years before this one. It's about uh, modules on children's testimonies. These are classroom modules, they are free. This is something you can take to your class where an academy, an academic class, it's for college students and up. And they're based on children's testimonies. One of the children here in, uh, in this module two is a Yasu girl uh, who is now looking at us and uh, so these are free. This is uh, they have examples of testimony. Some are analyzed, and some are for your students to analyze. So we are trying to be like a place, a repository, where people will put in their materials. People who will look for materials will find it. And uh, it, this indeed is the, the fifth workshop. But actually, we, we we think this work has just begun. We believe that we have to. And this is what we are looking for funding. By the way, everyone is looking for funding. So sorry. Is about uh, first uh, doing more research. So I can tell you that Western Galilee College got this year a grant from the Israeli Ministry of Science for researching a, a three issues connected the, to the after effects of the Holocaust. We we I'm my I'm doing child rehabilitation after the Holocaust. Uh, my colleague Miriam Ofer who is today not with us because she's sitting in the, uh, the Medical International Commission of the Lancet planning curriculum on the uh, Holocaust and, and uh, medicine. So, uh, so she's doing Holocaust and medicine and we have a team of doctors doing a uh, morbidity of Holocaust survivors. And we are all in the same idea that the work done on the Holocaust is relevant today, ethical, Medical ethics is relevant today, and child rehabilitation of, of war affected children is relevant today. And we convinced the Ministry of Science that this is relevant today. And uh, what we feel the next step is, is trying to get the academic material uh, out there to the people working in the field. Because this is obvious that if I wrote an amazing paper, really a good one in a good journal, about women caretakers of which Hasia mentioned here was one of my heroes. And if I wrote an academic paper about her, it's a 30 page paper with tons of footnotes. And no caretaker in the field, no practitioner in the field today will read 30 pages in English now. 
I mean, uh, some, many of them will not. And if we want to reach, I'm talking about the people in the field, in the uh, hostel, in the shelter, we have to uh, translate the academic knowledge into a uh, present day knowledge, into, into present day medias, into short bites. I mean, someone told in our first conference, she said, I, I, she said, I got it, historians speak at length, but people in the field need it short. I mean, we, we do big papers and we do good research, really good research, but it, people in the field need it in two and a half minute bites. Or in 15 uh, uh, minutes uh, you hear uh, uh, on the way from the train to, from the metro to the, to the workplace. So we need it translated to languages. We need it translated in to short bites. We need to provide, this is by the way, one of the things I told you about, we are starting in Western Galilee in two weeks from now. Hello. Uh, uh, we have started uh, uh, two days, in two weeks from now, we are starting our international innovation course for Holocaust memory with stu 40 students from all over the world, China, India, Austria, uh, South Africa, Britain, uh, Switzerland, uh, Hungary, etc., Israel, uh, coming together to develop new ideas in Holocaust memory. Uh, to perpetuate Holocaust memory, to make it relevant. So this is another path we are following. But actually, what you see here is a project that uh, uh, Verena and I started a few years ago. We are looking for cooperation. We are looking for people who want to do project with us. Uh, we want to write policy papers for people working in the field for uh, both on the macro level of people uh, making decisions and also on the micro level of the staff. So uh, we are open to ideas and that we think that uh, a lot of people argue, is this Holocaust comparison right? Is that Holocaust comparison right? Is uh, We have a, the sure comparison. We are not saying that everything in the world is about Hol is Holocaust today, but the one issue of the work after World War II and the Holocaust with these children, which is generally, actually, when you look at it, uh, successful. You know, I mean, not that there are no traumas, but if you look at the this generation, like the Yasur group, these people uh, built a life. And where, we, and where it didn't work, it's also important to learn what was wrong. So this is relevant today. So this is what we feel. And uh, so we don't have to do, all, uh, we don't have to start arguing, is this right to compare or is that right to compare? We are saying it's relevant today. Uh, so uh, the recording, by the way, of this uh, event will go, of course, on the, uh, on the conversation page where you registered for this event. We'll put it there, but we'll also put it, link it to uh, this site. And the site is very easy to get to. It's called CWG 1945. And uh, I see, uh, so we are open to all sorts of ideas and corporations and uh, uh, we want to make uh, the world a better place. And you think this is one interesting place where historians can really make a difference. So uh, uh, I'm sharing this with you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for the uh, great practitioners we had here, uh, great historians and practitioners, people. Thank you to Father Debois, who couldn't, uh, who found out yesterday that he can't attend and already 7 a.m. this morning recorded the. Uh, uh, the, the, the interview with Verena. Uh, we were very honored by him uh, joining us here. Uh, and I think uh, uh, this is only a beginning. We are so happy to do this and we'll be happy to do more of this. Just be in touch. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just a question. I didn't manage to read all the messages. Will we, will we see? I, I will send you the recording. Okay. We, I send you the chat file. 
Ah, okay, okay, because otherwise okay. I'll, I'll miss I it. I send all the speakers the chat file. Okay. So if you thank you to the speakers and stuff, they'll see it, we'll send them the, the file. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So thank very you much. very much. And uh, I'll oh. just a minute if I find it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all. And now we hope to meet you in person. But this, by the way, is the first time we brought our message abroad to so many people. Thanks. Never we had, <laughs> we never had these numbers. So actually, for us, this is an opportunity that uh, we really cherish. So thank you. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. תודה רבה. בבקשה.